You know, INEC has this countdown where it shows you just how many days, up to the minute and hours, we have up until the presidential election. And at this moment, we have exactly 46 days and, what, 25 minutes. Yes, it's as accurate as that to the 2023 presidential election. Of course, uh, the governorship and others happens uh, some weeks after. And we're focusing on that. This is crunch time. This is a critical period uh, for that election where a lot of people have to decide on which candidate they're voting for. Uh, the electoral umpire talks about election management, security agencies, lots of components coming together so you, you can understand why there's a lot of activity around that. And this morning, as you've seen, we're being joined right here in our Lagos studio by the presidential candidate of AAC, Mr. Omoyele Shore. He's also the publisher of Sahara Reporters. Good morning and thank you for joining us on Sunrise Daily. Thank you for bringing me. Happy lots of Day issues. <laughs> oh, I, I know. I yes. wish you the same. Lots thank of issues to raise, yes. uh, really. And I'll start from the big one, election management. Yes. Just yesterday, it would seem INEC is raising this alarm about security and how it will affect the coming elections. I mean, we'll come into your own manifesto and all of that, but we need to speak to this one. We have 46 days yes. uh, to the election. So uh, tell us, do you share those fears that INEC has regarding security and how it might affect the election up until the point that it might say postponement or what? Cancellation? Well, uh, we had a meeting as uh, party leaders with uh, security agencies in the country at the IG's office a few weeks ago, and we did raise this issue, uh, but they, as usual, downplayed it. What has happened to Nigeria over these years is that uh, Nigeria has failed successively in the security area, and in other areas too, but mostly in, in, in terms of security. And what we found out is that a lot of non-state actors are in control of territory in Nigeria. And we've been in denial about that. And that is why INEC is now coming out openly to say, well, these elections are threatened. That's number one. The second aspect of it is how they also deactivate public interest in elections. You know, when they have, the, there's always a secret agenda in every election, every election cycle. You'll be hearing stories about plans to have interim government uh, by some persons, very influential members of society. And now INEC is coming out to say, well, elections may not hold as planned, or they might be cancelled because they have security. We've always known that we have security uh, issues, but to have pushed Nigerians to a point where everybody is now ready for elections, and you're now a few days, you know, this could be called days, to the election, saying, we are, you know, we might get the election postponed or cancelled. It's basically to create confusion and make people lose interest in the election itself. Yeah. But, you know, this is not the first time we've had some sort of postponement. We, we, we saw that uh, during yeah. the uh, Jonathan period, mm -hmm. and it was about security as well. Yes. Give us time. Let yes. us try to sort the security issues. But what is maybe different this time around is just some days ago, and I'm sure you, you, you heard that, that the Borno State governor actually said that the state is 90% safe for elections. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, that was a bright spot. 90%, if you judge, that's mm -hmm. excellent, really. And that's a pass mark. So... When you weigh that against this recent announcement by INEC, or at least this pronouncement, uh, do you still think it, it, it worth something for well, the Borno State I'm, government to say see, that? I, I have my own theory. There's always a conspiracy against democracy in this country. And my feeling, apart from what is obvious to everybody in terms of security, is that they have other plans. I mean the ruling class and their uh, friends who may not directly be in office, but they always have a different plan. When Jonathan postponed the election during his time, he had a different agenda. You know, there were security reports that he couldn't win the election or he wouldn't win the election. So they sent uh, Dasuki to the UK, Chatham House, to announce the postponement, and that was done. During the 2019 election as well, they, for some reasons, I think they found out, you know, they had to tidy up some of their acts. They postponed the election. The election, the presidential election in Nigeria has always been postponed for some unknown reason. But this time around, I don't see any reason why, after all the hoopla about uh, Bivas, you know, the preparedness of INEC, you know, all the documents being in place, we're hearing about postponement, 46 days to election. It shows that there's something beneath that has not been told to the public and the yeah. public is not saying. But for someone who has been a direct observer of how these guys manipulate the public during election cycles, I know there's more to this than uh, meet the eyes. Mr. Shawara, yeah. I imagine that you must feel 
you know, passionate, must be, must be passionate about security, be, having lost a brother, yes. you know, to attacks, you know, by quote-unquote non-state actors. Yes. Uh, just yesterday, we heard that uh, there was a clash between Yoruba nation agitators and, uh, you know, security agents. Another presidential candidate is acknowledging, you know, that very real threat of non-state actors and is proposing carrot and sticks approach. I wonder what your... Uh, um, you know, solution would be if you were elected president? No, I, uh, the solutions are not going to just be carrot and steak. It's to look at which part of Nigeria has what security issue. Because there's no one size fit all solution to this. Yeah, you look at Nigeria regionally, you know, you look at the South South, there is a problem of militancy. That's why we can't sell more than a million barrels of uh, crude on a daily basis. It's real, it's latent, it's with us. You look at the Southeast, there's a problem of agitation for you know, nationhood. You look at uh, the Northwest, there's banditry, the Northeast, there's terrorism. And above all, there is also governmental terrorism on its own. Like, you know, this idea of killing people who are engaging in peaceful protests. It's also a threat to security, because imagine if all the Yoruba nation agitators start another agitation today now. The Southwest is out of the picture. Uh, for, you know, dissent or peaceful elections. So you wonder why the Nigerian state goes out to poke the barrel, uh, I mean, uh, the bear, uh, you know, in the, in the face at a time that is crucial and sensitive. Like, that's why I keep talking about the fact that there's a conspiracy theory behind the need, I mean, behind all these activities that you hear from. But again, you ask me directly, what would I do? Uh, as president of Nigeria, so look at all these areas and bring out what would fit their own peculiar security challenge. For the Southeast, it will be dialogue. For the bandits, it will be stick. Uh, for the militants, it will be further dialogue and how to fix the environment and the issues that is making this militancy come together. You cannot, for instance, cede the security of Nigeria's water so an individual expects for you to say that you are a nation. Nobody takes us serious when they wake up one day and say, oh, we just gave a contract to a guy uh, to take care of uh, territorial waters. Uh, there's no country in the world that does that. You have just said to the world, I don't have a navy. Mm. You know, yes. Uh, you're saying to the world when people get kidnapped frequently from schools, from their workplace, that you don't have a police. So you have to set up all these security issues. But most importantly, this is needed, and we must keep saying it. Without solving the socioeconomic problems of our people, we can't get the kind of security that we but, need. But, but pardon me to yeah. ask, why the selective approach for the different types of... Because... Uh, we, because they, they have done the same damage to the Nigerian state. No, no. The, the damage done by the Nigerian state to its citizen is what we are reaping from. See? If you had done justice to the Southeast after the Civil War, nobody would be agitating for Biafra. You understand? If there has been social economic justice across Nigeria in the way that it should be, you know, there are not two rich people and two poor people, and you have 133 million people who are in multidimensional poverty, you know, uh, and then five people who are in multidimensional wealth, then you, you have dislocations in society, and mm -hmm. in addressing them, you must apply leadership. So, for instance, it has been said, and I studied this while I was in school, as far back as 2003, that any kind of terrorism that lasts more than 10 years, or conflict, internal conflict, requires just more than shooting at people. Uh, you have to look at it fundamentally, right. see who you can talk to, who can be rehabilitated, and who needs to be taken out completely. Well, lo lots of issues to raise, yes. and uh, maybe we should just get into some other ones now. About the crude oil production, uh, We've since crossed that 1 million mark, yes. by the way. We're now at 1.235 sure? as of December. <laughs> I mean, these are official figures. Yes. And um, you just quoted an official figure that 133 million people out of poverty. So yeah. at least we have that to refer to. We were struggling to get to 1 million before that. But uh, a lot of people seeing you in Lagos will wonder, why are you in Lagos? Are you campaigning this time around since we have seen a different approach? So let's get into your own ambition, your yeah. bid. Yeah. Uh, are you, is it a campaign you're here for in Lagos? What see, exactly is going on? Over time, uh, since 2019, somehow our political party and movement has led the transformation and innovative style of campaigning. In 2019, I wasn't doing the regular kind of campaigning that politicians were doing because 
I hate the echo chamber style of campaigning. You pack people in the stadium, having paid them, and then you bring in comedians, musicians, and when it's time for the presidential candidate to speak, he barely says anything, and then he moves on. Even the media can't come out of any campaign today and say, this is what I heard from the presidential candidate. So we started talking directly with the people. And don't forget that the campaign that was done in 1963, where you put people in a stadium, is not the same in 2023, because there are multidimensional ways of campaigning. You can use the internet, you can reach people in their houses now than you could before. Uh, you can go to professional organizations and have town hall meetings with them. Not the kind of town hall meetings that these other candidates do. So we decided that having gone through all these transformational, technologically driven ways of talking to people, we can reach more people by attending an ICANN event. And you can hear back from them than putting people in a stadium, paying them 5,000 naira. Same people, after you leave, will change their t-shirts and go for the other party the next day. Because of poverty, weaponized poverty, people don't even have political ideologies or parties anymore. They just do whatever can make them get by on a daily basis. So we are not doing those kind of denigrating type of rallies. Of course, we will do some of those. So what we decided to do is to have what we call people assemblies. We've been in Kano, I've been in um, Cross River State, Calabar, I've been in Port Harcourt. And of course, you know, because we're not deep pockets, the media don't cover us the way, you know, the other big pockets get covered. When I say media, I don't, I don't have money to pay for a live coverage. And, and it's not a crime that people do live coverages. But I can also reach people on Twitter, on Facebook. I can reach them on Instagram, Snapchat. Some of these platforms are not known by the mainstream politicians, but it reaches a lot more people. So that's why I'm in Lagos. And, uh, you know, I haven't been in Lagos for a long time, uh, by the way. I was restricted to Abuja for three years. But you know you require the popularity and, you know, the structure as what is referred to in Nigerian parlance, you know, to get ahead in the election. So what are you relying on? Is it on your popularity from your activism? No, I'm relying on the people. Uh, I, I think when it comes to popularity, there's a difference between popularity and ifemi. You know, a lot of the political people you're talking about, they're not popular. They're infamous, but of course, they are known by the people because of their infamous nature. We are bringing ideas to bear on the political process, and I'm proud to say this that for someone like me who hasn't been in political position, having acquired a legal wealth, that I can bring ideas, I can challenge the status quo up to this point, is something that anybody who wants to do this in the future can be proud of. And I'm sure that ideas would win one day in this country. Because the other people are not talking about anything. They're just throwing numbers and figures and all this uh, you know, superficial rallies, and I'm very sure they're superficial, to confuse people. And I know a lot of our people are not confused by those things. Let, let's step back a bit, yes. really. And um, this is about you now. This is more personal. And I'd like you to speak to this for a lot of people who see you. And maybe they're, they're trying to place you because they think maybe you're an enigma of sorts. I mean, they saw you in videos behind MKO. You've since spoken about that one. Uh, you lived in the U.S. for, what, two decades, 20, 20 years? years. Uh, you joined politics. You came back to Nigeria, joined politics, yeah. publisher uh, of um, Sahara Reporters and all of that. And they still look at you and try to place you. Uh, is he the kind of person Nigeria needs? Is he a politician? Is he an activist? Some even describe you as an SUG president. I'm sure you've seen that on social yeah. media yeah. and all of that. What drives you? And I'd like you to speak to that. What exactly drives you? Well, you know, let me put it a number of ways. I'm the kind of person that I've, in my entire life built everything from the scratch. You know, I, I grew up in a village, you know, just in Nona Scribble. Didn't have it. Today hasn't had electricity, no post offices. You know, I heard about universities from other people, never read about them. Uh, I used to go pick sketch newspaper and Tribune and read on my own when my father would bring them in. Having been wrapped with bread, you know, having wrapped it with, you know, wrapped bread. And must then, be still used Yeah, so, uh, and I left, I came to the University of Lagos. When I arrived at the University of Lagos, if you didn't have nice shoes, nice clothes, you didn't have a car, nobody reckoned with you. Then I became president of the student union at the age of 21. You're talking about MK Wabiola. We kind of started the Chinese TV station with that struggle in 1992. I didn't say like we started it. 
but uh, John Momo personally used to follow the cameraman around, and that's how he met me with M. K. Abiola. As a true reporter that yes, he is. Yes. So I never knew that that video even existed until 2018 when I woke up one day and somebody said, I saw you behind Abiola. I thought it was only a photograph. And the guy that took the picture at Vanguard newspaper died before I could lay my hand on because I knew it happened. So, so I've always built everything from the scratch. People can place where I stand, you know, when I did Sahara reporters, I built it from the scratch. When I wanted to contest in 2018, I built a political party from the scratch. So I'm not that lucky to have been born with a silver spoon or any kind of spoon mm. in my mouth. So that's why sometimes people find it difficult. The SUG uh, 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 connotation that they give to my name, I think I see it as, you know, a kind of blessing because for me to have been an SUG leader in, I mean, when I was 21 years old, and it's still respected today, that means I did something when I was young with my life. And, but part of it is also what we call psych ops in, in elections. You know, psychological oppression, you make people feel degraded to the point that they don't value themselves. And that's what they've done to an average Nigerian so youth. So all of the mudslinging, so you're not, you're not distracted. It's part of election. So, by process. the way, when you talk about your party, you've since stepped down as a chairman. People who say I'm SUG, why are they afraid to debate me on TV? Right, so you've since <laughs> stepped down as a chairman of the AAC, am I correct? No, I stepped down to run as in as the primaries. President. After the primaries, we'll have a special, after this election, we'll have a special uh, convention to elect the chairman. So, so and I'm not going back as a candidate in that. Right. So when you talk about ideas yeah. now, and uh, I mean, this is a, also personal. Why do you think the Nigerians have not been able to resonate with your ideas? Uh, I mean, the previous elections, you'll expect uh, with the following that you seem to have with all of that. Why do you think Nigerians have not it's primarily not, not been true. able to resonate it's not true with that those they don't ideas resonate, and your person, you know, such that they will vote for you overwhelmingly? Is no, what they, I mean. So if anybody voted for me overwhelmingly in 2019, how would you know when they were performing a selection? It wasn't an election. I was arrested shortly after 2019 election. What was I arrested for? They claimed that I was trying to overturn the election and overthrow the government. If I wasn't relevant, if I was... No, those are two elected. different things. You're talking about the election and then you... No, because they, two no different I'm things. telling you... I'm telling I think you it's important to speak to the facts. No, no. This the election facts, was I'm telling indeed you the facts as a con I was, I was, Nigerians went out to vote for don't their candidates. So, so, yeah. Will you listen to this? We're just talking about the election now. We have 46 days to election. You are reading on uh, your platform this morning. The election may not hold. They know what they are doing, but trust me, they will, do, they will conduct an election and it will produce a result that do not conform with the popular wish of the people. That's why they are confusing the people with, oh, we're going to postpone, we're not sure. You know, somebody in Borno is telling do you, you that 90% 90 of Borno is available, is free. And you believe that? You're a journalist. No, it's, no, not, it's not no, possible. So this is about you projecting. 25% of Bono is not governed. Do you think it is fair for you to preempt in such manner and speak I'm assuredly, just, saying, trust me, when you've not even... I mean, we're 46 days to this. Yeah. I understand the, no, the opinion, we're, 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 perhaps a pain, we're, but we're speaking preemptively, do you think it's fair? We're analyzing what has come to us officially. Promise you, on my way here, I didn't even know that they had planned to prom, you know, put on the elections because, you know, we're busy with a lot of meetings, you know, overnight. But I came here, I heard about it first from you. And that's the way it should be. Journalists should be the first source of information. But I'm telling you that this is a pattern. I've been around for three decades but dealing Shore, with the same characters Shore, it, out of uniform and in uniform. So I know what Mr. they're Shore, up to. Mr. Shore, if you, if you had to preempt it or counter it, as my colleague Cardi has rightly noted, I think what is best is for you to provide a counter information so that will speak to the fact no, I'm providing rather to you than my own personal suggestions experience. or conjecture. He didn't, for instance, he didn't let me finish that. Part of the reason I was abducted and detained. I was detained right around you here at the Changisha before I was flown to Abuja. The first thing they confronted me with was that I went to uh, Dubai to collect $100 million from somebody. Is that a fact? No. I've never been, when I told them I've never been to Dubai before, they just moved on. They got a judge, Taiwo Taiwo, to detain me for, it's to retire now, for 45 days without evidence of any, mis you know, other than the fact that they said she already collected $100 million from Dubai. The judge didn't want them to provide my passport or to provide any evidence he just threw me in jail for 45 days. When 45 days expired, they went to try to renew. He said no. Uh, and then they brought charges against me. The charges to today have not been proven. It's not even a judge hearing my case anymore. So when I'm speaking from my own personal experience that this is how they operate, you should believe me more than what they tell you.
well, some will say they also have their personal experiences, which is what we do in journalism. Yes. Fair hearing. Yes. I'm sure there's balance and all of that. But let's project sort of into yeah. uh, your potential administration. If you were to win uh, this election, there are people win. that... That, of course, I mean, that's yeah. what politicians will say well, naturally. <laughs> I know you don't like that tag, but you're a politician. You're involved in politics. I'm glad you're, you know I don't like it. You're a presidential candidate because I was preempting you there. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of people that see you as someone who will take drastic decisions yes. if you were to be president. In fact, some had even propped you for a possible head of an anti-corruption agency. And who maybe we'll that? get to that. So what are the kind of drastic decisions you, you would want to take? For Nigeria, you've talked about the poverty figures, yeah. insecurity. Yeah. So, if you were to be president, what will be those maybe first two drastic decisions you'll take? And indeed, will they be drastic? Yes. Well, they will be drastic in the sense that Nigeria is about to tip over if drastic actions are not taken. Uh, but let's break it down into two segments. One is foundational, because Nigeria has a foundational problem, and that's why people are asking for restructuring and all those, you know, big buzzwords. But mine, one of the drastic measures I'll take is to start towards creating a brand new constitution for Nigeria. That's foundational. And the constitution we take into consideration some of the drastic things I like to say. I like to cut down the cost of governance. You know, one of the ways I want to do that is to get rid of one of the arms of the legis one of the legislative arms in Nigeria. You know, I'm not going to be able to do that without their support. But that will be a legislative agenda for me as the president of Nigeria. The second foundational issue is, like I said, you know, have Nigerians come together and decide on the future of the country, just like South Africans did after the end of apartheid. The second part is, are those institutional drastic decisions that need to be taken in the area of security, you know, to make sure that you have the right people in place, you know, directing the security agenda of our own government and to aggressively pursue power, electricity. Within my first few days in office, I want to sign contracts to keep this country uh, not in darkness, but in light. And that will be to generate some 20,000 megawatts of electricity using different kinds of mix of getting electricity, solar, tidal, whatever will give us electricity, including waste, I'll do it. So, and that is compulsory for me because if you want to pull people out of poverty, you have to industrialize and produce. And if you want to produce, you must have power. There's no country in the world that's ever experienced an industrial revolution without electricity. We're deceiving ourselves. And then the rest with infrastructure, healthcare, education, uh, agriculture, because we must be able to feed these 200 million people first and foremost. If you take that out of the 133 million, there's food. You know, your poverty figures will reduce drastically, your GDP will go up, and you won't have all these fake figures that okay. keeps us thinking that Nigeria is functioning when Nigeria is not. Right. Uh, there's also a very, you know, critical problem that Nigeria has, which is the economy. And um, towards the end of this administration, we've seen the proposal of a redesigning of the Naira notes. And I've heard you say that, you know, that is he it's a joke. Is headed nowhere. And it as has headed as, nowhere. As president, what would you do differently you know, to tackle so inflation, the value of yeah. the Naira, and other related so, issues? So the value of the Naira or inflation, they're all tied to a fundamental economic shift, you know, and the way my own economic agenda will shift is to look at the political economy that is driving our economic system. A structural adjustment program that has lasted and, you know, become ineffective is not the kind of route that we go. Uh, what Nigeria has been doing since the 80s, since the military era, is to get the World Bank and the IMF to turn Nigeria into a junk yard where you come and dump your own products, they dump their own products, they force us, even at the WTO, to buy things we don't need, things we have, like, you know, flour. Uh, so I will shift that radically and ensure that the kind of economic agenda we have for Nigeria is one that leads to proper production, the empowerment of citizens by ensuring that you address a wide range of, or a spectrum of things that can empower the country. So, for instance, there is no reason why we should be importing Ankara from China. But the reason why it's cheaper to import from China is that the one in Kaduna will cost you more to produce one yard of Akara because you don't have electricity. And if you are going to use diesel, uh, your cost of production will go up. You know, I've mentioned it and people hate to hear this, uh, that our workers are being paid what I call slave wages and we're going to pay people. If you want to make them productive, you have to incentivize them. There is nobody in the world, and I mean not even cockroaches can live on 30,000 naira a month. 
you know, I know a number of cockroaches around me, and they eat a lot. So, <laughs> and I'm saying this uh, metaphorically, uh, not to refer to cockroaches as humans. But so you must get your economy to that. You must get your education right, so that we we'll produce the kind of workforce that can keep the country sustained in the long term as a productive uh, country and competitive country. We must right. have something we are putting in the international market from our side. Before we can be talking about the value of our Naira. Are you going to sever ties with the international financial institutions? No, uh, but they have to respect us. You know, for instance, if we are owing you loans and we can't explain how we got about it, we'll post the loan. I've said it, 77 trillion Naira of loans can be dubious. And we have to investigate and audit that. But most importantly is to say, look, you know, we want to grow our own economy first before we become a slave to loans that we have no reason to believe in. So they understand that because they've done that for Turkey, they've done that for Greece, they've done that for a lot of countries that have such economic problems. You can't be spending 80% of your revenue on loans and expect to make progress. It's, it's not going to work. They understand this, but they need people who also understand their people and who understand how to fight for their own people, for them to respect that such an agreement is possible. But when they have bozos in government, they love it when they have in government the kind of leaders you have in Nigeria. They just tell them, come to Washington. People don't even ask you, pack yourself in, a, uh, in an aircraft. The little money you have, you burn it and you come back. Nothing comes out of it. You want to govern the country, not to govern a space above your people. And that's what leadership means. And that's why Nigerians must be given that opportunity to choose the right leaders to govern the country. This is a problem we've had since independence, or even before independence. We keep promoting the failed ones. We say, you know, they have, they have big rallies, they have big money, you know, they can, they can do this and that. But at the end of the day, four years later, you're back, you're poorer than the last time you voted. Mm. And all the governments we've had, the last worst one is always better than the the, the, the existing terrible one. Uh, I like to ask that we also respect the personality of people, even I'm though not, you might not be happy with them, but using that you know, sort of term. Uh, no, uh, you, you, know, you, know that, you know that no, when no, it comes okay, to respect, on, on the, it's on the reciprocal. They, they also have to respect it's us. It's okay, but you pride yourself as someone who speaks of ideas, who yeah. literally, so I expect that, I mean, as you have always shown. But yeah. I'd like you to speak to this point, because you've pride, you, I mean, literally, one of your selling points, really, is being able to resonate with young people. Yeah. And I would recall when you started off, you had some support from young people. But uh, right now, it would seem that young people, a lot of young people are tilting uh, towards another candidate. And I wonder for you how you think that may have happened, if you think you may be lost in that area and maybe you don't have as much support from young people because they make a huge chunk of the voting population. So how do you plan maybe to win young people to your side? No, I don't know why people keep making up statistics that are not true. You understand? Because there's nothing scientifically proven that young people in any part of this country moved in direction of any particular candidate. All the candidates can prove that they have young people. If you want to prove using superficial means as to who has the most young people, you look at the rallies held by the oldest candidates. They have young people too because they have the capability to hire young people. But there's evidence on social media. Social media does of that not on it. So, so that is, the, the, way, the way to look at it is a to look at. Uh, political, uh, no, party it's not correct. And their candidates. No, it's not correct. It's Why a, do you say it's not so correct? Look at regionally in the country. Are you going to say that the northwest and the northeastern part of the country have young people tilted towards a particular candidate? Probably no. The southwest, all the young people have their own political positions and they don't tilt towards the southwest in history has never supported one particular candidate. Even when they had Obafemi Awolo, they had opposition. So maybe you can say the southeast might have a preponderance of more young people tilted towards a candidate for reasons best known to politics. Okay, so which region is tilting towards Shuware and the AAC? Across the country. What is the evidence? The evidence is all over the place, but do you, are you interested in the evidence? No, we're interested. You're that's interested what, that's in, why we're having, you are interested that's in social having media this conversation. And, just ask and I evidence. tell you, you know, I work in the social media sector. Everything you see in the social media sector can be manipulated if you have enough money and you have enough ability to use tech to manipulate it. For instance, some of the candidates you are referring to, they are using boats, boats, and you can manufacture boats 
if you go to Singapore, you go to China, you can get somebody to create boats for you to make it look like each time you post a particular, uh, you post a particular content, you get people a lot are following of you. Activity around yes. that. So, you, you know, you can go on Instagram and pay up Instagram influencers, as they call them. They may not even believe or know your name. Okay, well, well, why you that, Mr. So uh, it's, it's a lot more than that. So it's a combination. We, we have, of, yeah. um, I mean, uh, credible data, as it were, at least data that you can hold on to. Yeah. First, INEX says with the recent registration, majority of them are young people. That's going correct. To their PVCs. That's one. But what should you the ask INEX is that how many me. of those young people we're, 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 we're winding down. PVCs. We're winding down. Yes. That's a major point you yes. raise. Also, mm -hmm. the polls don't put you ahead, and it's, it's, it's expected that... Who are the people that, conducting polls? I mean, there's the ANAP, ANAP NOI polls. ANAP is, is, there are other polls ANAP that we have is the campaign manager time. of Peter Abina. Well, it's okay for you not to feel no, that no, way, because, because it doesn't because favor because I'm a you. No, no, then, because then I'm a journalist then too. Then again, Mr. You know, Shore, it must provide are, evidence to prove that ANAP is the campaign manager for a particular that is, presidential that candidate. That is, uh, what's this guy's name, the bank guy? He's, he can't deny it. I've challenged him several times. We're seeing the, the, the list of the PCC no. of the Labour Party. So for you to say that... Without what is the list of there. the PCC of the Labour Party? So his, is his name there? No. But you know, Anna, you don't say when, right? when, I, Anna when I say that, these are things that I the know. Past. You can ask him to challenge, I can challenge him to a debate. And no, I can okay. provide you evidence. To to, he, will exactly. never, he will never deny it. But you've never presented Peter, 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 I, forget, I keep forgetting his name. Mr. Shawari, Anap had conducted Anna polls Anna, in the past I, I know, when, you know. when the presidential candidate of the Labour Party was a vice presidential candidate. No. It had conducted polls prior to that time as well. Yes. So why now do you claim that he's the he, I campaign have manager I have for it. the presidential he's candidate the, the of the Labour Party? Campaign. We have he's to wind down now. It's always running running interesting. Campaign. He can't deny it. Right, we have to wind down now. It's always interesting speaking <laughs> yes, to you, but we have you made this fact. And it's important for you if you have counterfact to put it out there for Nigeria. No, we had, I, this counterfact, this up, it's, for, it's also up to you to listen to counterfacts. We, we've just listened. You've not given us any <laughs> documents. No, I'm not just giving you one. And I've asked you to contact this. It comes to your studio. We have time. to run now. 46 days to the election, so yes. it looks like we'll be having more of this. But we'd like to Absolutely. thank you so much uh, you for, for your time. Me. Mr. Moya yeah. Lishore is the presidential candidate of the AAC and publisher of Sahara Reporters. Thank you one more time. Thank you. Well, we're literally just getting started on the show. That's just maybe a tip of the iceberg, you could call it that. So we'll be back in just a moment for more on the program. Please stay with us.